Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm joined by Pat Sarazin. He's going to share with us some of the charts that are top of mind for him, particularly looking at interest rates. Overall, it's quite an environment. You have the S&P selling off fairly aggressively going into the close, only finishing down about half a percent. But overall, it's uh, sort of a bifurcated market. You have stocks that are working, you have stocks breaking out to the upside, end phase and others ripping up uh, uh, to the upside. On the, on the downside, you have names like Boeing and Intel and others that are really uh, starting to struggle. So where does the S&P net out? How does that relate to the long-term trend? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the market environment, market dynamics, using the power of technical analysis, using charts to help us understand lessons and information related to supply and demand, fear and greed, euphoria, desperation, how all of those things are reflected in the uh, price of assets. As I was reminded many times early, my, early on in my career by some of my early mentors, if you know nothing else about the market environments, look at a chart of the S&P 500. That will tell you most of what you need to know about the overall dynamics at work. There's a lot else that you can use to better understand the dynamics, to better uh, understand leadership and laggardship, where the opportunities might be, but focus on price as always. And, and what you're seeing, I think now, is sort of mixed messages of sorts. Um, you know, today, most of the averages actually netted out pretty, pretty negatively, particularly in mid and small caps, which actually had a fairly, fairly negative day, a, a worse day than, uh, than on average uh, going back in, in recent uh, weeks and months. But quite a bit of di distribution going into the close, and it was particularly in the cyclicals, industrials, materials, financials, energy, all at the bottom of the return list. So what does that mean for the overall health of the market, particularly in a, uh, in a heavy earnings week? as we continue on an earnings season. We'll get to all of those themes as much as we can in 30 minutes here very quickly. I'm excited for uh, today's guest, Pat Ceresna, uh, coming up the rest of this week. On Thursday, we have Doug Bush from Chart Smarter. Next week on Tuesday, Joe Rabel from Rabel Stock Research. Then on Wednesday, the third, Christopher Mullen from the Technical Traders joining us on the show again. Also, our latest episode of The Pitch airs today. Uh, it was a uh, really fun discussion recorded a little earlier uh, with Grayson Rose moderating a discussion. Mark Newton, um, uh, who else was on there? Uh, Jay Woods, uh, former executive floor governor of the New York Stock Exchange, and uh, Greg Schnell from gregschnell.com. Had a really good discussion about ideas and how to think between now and year end from a technical perspective. Also, I will be speaking at the Money Show coming up next week. I'll be doing a presentation with my friend Julius De Kempener, who's the founder of RRG Research and hosts his own show, Sector Spotlight, here on Stock Charts TV. He's been on my show before, and I know he's actually guest hosted the show recently. I know most of you know uh, him and his work. We're actually going to do a presentation together called Sector Plays Through Year End. We'll use the RRG and then look at uh, Diva, dig a little deeper into some of the individual sectors and talk about themes and ideas going uh, between now and year end. Go to stockcharts.com slash money show to sign up for that event and to get more information on the uh, Money Show Virtual Expo. Let's continue on with today's show with our market recaps. I mentioned quite a bit of distribution going into the close. And, you know, usually I was taught early in my career that last hour is really when the institutions are on the move. That gives you in general, if you want to summarize what that is probably telling you, it tells you institutional flows because that's when they'll do a lot of the bigger trades at the end of the day. You also have ETFs that rebalance and other things that happen uh, toward the end of the day. But first 30 minutes is usually thought of as more retail oriented, the last 30 to 60 minutes, a little more institutional. And the distribution that you saw going into the close certainly indicates uh, you know better selling over buying overall. The S&P finishing down about half a percent, close right around 45.50. And if you think of the chart of the S&P 500, which we'll show here, that is pretty much the peak, right? That was the high from September. Round tripping to 45.50 was quite noteworthy uh, about a week ago when we then broke above 45.50. Now we've come back to trade uh, the low for today right around that same level. So when you have a chart where you have a breakout, it's all about, in my opinion, the breakout and then the follow through, right? Do we break above the key resistance level? That's step one. Do we confirm it, right? Which means 
You have to continue to follow through to the upside. You have to hold that breakout level on any sort of pullbacks. And what we're seeing right now is that breakout level being tested from above. So, you know, a classic bull market move would be a breakout, a retest of the breakout level, and then you rotate higher and move on to uh, onward and ever upward to higher highs. But we need to uh, hold that uh, hold that high first. So 4550 continue to be an important level to pay attention to. And I would be very keenly focused on that level uh, coming up tomorrow, the rest of the week, and, uh, and certainly into next week. Uh, just around the horn on some of the other uh, major market averages and other asset classes, mid caps and small caps, as I mentioned, uh, dramatically underperformed today with the S&P 600 really moving lower through the course of the day. So while the S&P was sort of choppy and then dropped into the close, small caps were really just headed downward through most of the day. And if you look at what sectors were struggling today, it's energy, it's financials, materials, industrials. I don't know for sure off the top of my head, but I think all four of them probably are more heavily weighted in the small cap index than in the large cap index. Uh, certainly things like financials have more, uh, more uh, heavier weight in, uh, in, in mid and small caps because there are a lot of regional banks and others that, uh, that are pretty big in some of those indexes. Other uh, asset classes, very quick, interest rates coming off today. So the 10-year yield yesterday at the close was around 162, finishes the day today around 153. So you're seeing a drop in rates. We talked about that 150 to 175 range where the 10-year yield spent a lot of time earlier this year. We're still back into that range. And I'll be looking to see if that, uh, that general area is gonna hold. The dollar index, by the way, overall has been in an uptrend. We featured yesterday a chart of US versus global stocks, which, is, which has continued to favor US stocks overall. The dollar really not making a lot of uh, headway today. Looking at uh, the rest of the, uh, the asset classes, commodities overall down today and crude oil certainly struggling today. Copper prices down. Uh, gold was one of the few commodities that were actually in the positive. You have some others, natural gas and, and others. So sort of a mixed day, but on average sort of energy uh, prices lower. And that's why energy again was one of the, the worst sectors in the S&P today. Cryptocurrencies as a whole are coming off, and and I'm getting I'm getting a lot of questions on this with different media outlets. And you know, I, I in general, I think while Bitcoin and Ether and other cryptocurrencies by definition feel very volatile, which they are, the short term nature of them it feels like a much more compressed time frame, which I would agree it definitely is. But at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, good information to be found by looking at the longer term trends there and the longer term levels. My guest yesterday, Ramon Bogomasa from Wyckoff Analytics, did a great job sort of giving the longer term thesis on Bitcoin from a technical perspective, thinking about the structural trend, more the secular trend, and how these short term movements uh, relate to those. But having said that, you have something like, uh, you know, XRP, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin that are down significantly almost, you know, in the five to 10% range, but still overall that. Uh, that can mean they're, they, they, the longer term trend can certainly be different. So I think Bitcoin and Ether, I think overall you pay attention to the longer term trends. Ethereum is actually right around 4,000, which might be a really key level to pay attention to. I've found cryptocurrencies and big round numbers tend to uh, play pretty closely together as, uh, as the days go on. Continue on with uh, with just the uh, the sector update. So consumer discretionary, by the end of the day, the only one of the 11 S&P sectors that was actually uh, finished today in the green. Now you have some pretty uh, big names in there that have had fairly impressive runs, particularly uh, Tesla, Home Depot, two of the largest stocks in the XLY, which overall have uh, have held up very, very nicely, have been making uh, coming off of new all-time highs uh, again this week. And so not surprising that that sector is actually doing pretty well. The real story today is the weakness in the cyclical sector. When we think of cyclical sectors, a lot of things that have a cyclicality to them, but I'm thinking of some things like industrials and materials, some of those uh, economically sensitive sectors that tend to do very well when conditions are good. Uh, so today, giving back some of the previous gains. And if you look down in the uh, in the messages here, this is the predefined alert section of stock charts. And again, even if you don't trade off of these, if they're not the most important thing you look at, they're really helpful to understand when some of the dynamics are shifting. This section will actually flag you when indexes are hitting new all-time highs, new all-time lows. If that would happen, it's not happening in a lot of places right now. When something like gold or the TSX crosses a key level, but also tells you some of the characteristics underneath the hood, particularly bullish percent index. It's interesting to see consumer staples with a bullish percent index below 50. What that tells you is over half of the consumer staple stocks currently in the S&P, currently in a bearish trend according to their point and figure charts versus bullish trends, right? Uh, and that's what that would represent. The material sector coming below 70, which is what's called a bear alert, when the sector overall has been in a constructive pattern, you start to see some names uh, rotating lower. So it might be helpful to uh, focus on some of those. When you look at stocks on the move, we're going to have a little segment, a uh, segment a little later today called um, 
uh, the bottom line where we focus particularly on earnings. That's where we're going to hit on some of the big names of reporting this week uh, in stocks that, that certainly had some significant moves, things like Microsoft and uh, Alphabet and others that are having some uh, some decent rallies today. You know, it's worth taking a look at, at charts like Enphase. And I'm reminded of, I think it was Wells Wilder or it might've been W. Degan, and I probably should not confuse those two because they're very different uh, people, very different eras when they published uh, work on uh, related to technical analysis. But I think it was Wells Wilder talking about the challenges of trading uh, stocks. And the reason why he advocated trading commodities over equities is that you minimize company specific risk. The challenge for the, the upside for individual stocks is you have a lot more fundamental data, right? You have information, news flow on the company, information on new products. You can look at earnings growth. You can you know, understand their uh, you know, financial statements and make some deeper assessments. There's a lot more news flow on individual companies, uh, which, is, which is a positive. The negative on trading individual stocks is that you have that individual company risk. A stock can be up or down significantly on a, on a day. And, and, and this week, when you have earnings, you certainly can have stocks that are uh, that are significantly moving one way or the other. So Enphase is in a group called Renewable Energy Equipment. It's an interesting group. Uh, this is where we bucket them in technology, and it's things like solar stocks, like First Solar, Solar Winds. Those kind of things would be in that group as well. And battery names, hydrogen names are kind of all in this Renewable Energy Equipment uh, bucket. And you can see that Enphase uh, in the last week has actually been pulling off a little bit, pulling back from uh, the July high. So set a peak in uh, in early July, retested that in early August, was trading back up to that, pulling back a bit. Today, you have this big gap higher. And I think what's, you know, it's about 25% today. What's interesting now is you've gapped up to the previous highs, right? The long-term highs and the market has memory. So looking at key levels, looking left on the chart from the final bar, from the current price bar and seeing where we're at relative to that key resistance level, is it able to eclipse that? That's where you look for follow through and see if this is a sustainable bounce or just a short-term bounce off of a relatively weak level. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with my guest, Pat Ceresna. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's so good to have you join us every weekday after the close as we focus on the markets using the power of stock charts, using data visualization techniques to understand or better understand market psychology, market sentiment. A couple of quick announcements before we get to today's guest. Number one, we love hearing from you, particularly questions that are coming up as you are trying to use technical analysis to make better investment decisions. We're here to help address your questions on particular technical indicators, particularly ETFs or stocks, charts that you're struggling with, or just questions that come up in the normal uh, course of trying to navigate these markets together. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at final bar SCTV. We're on YouTube. Just put a comment below the video you're watching on our YouTube channel. We'd love to hear from you. We'll hope to answer one of your questions live on the air on Friday's show in our next mailbag segment. Also, as a reminder, go to StockChartsTV.com. That's our on-demand platform. You can access at any time from anywhere uh, all of our great content, special guests like Pat Saresna and many others, uh, special events like The Pitch, our year in review coming up in December, and all sorts of great uh, hosted content every weekday. Go to StockChartsTV.com or just search on any of the app stores on your mobile device for StockCharts TV On Demand. I want to welcome on today's guest joining us on the show once again, Pat Ceresna. Pat is the founder of Big Picture Trading. He's the co-host of the Market Huddle and Macro Voices podcast, uh, and I've enjoyed uh, joining him on the Market Huddle podcast before. It's uh, very, very well done. Pat, welcome back to the show. Dave, thanks for having me. Looking forward, forward to talking charts with you, buddy. Yeah, it's good to see you. So we're going to look at interest rates. Financials are down today, along with some of the uh, some of the other sectors, energy and, and elsewhere. And you know, I, we've been talking on the on our show uh, a lot of times just about the interest rate environment, the fact that rates have come up so much. Start us here. We're looking at different maturities on the on the yield curve. How are you making sense of things right now? Well, this is uh, one some really amazing things or interesting things are happening in the rates markets. And I was thinking, what can I talk about on the show that uh, is a little uh, off the beaten path of what we typically watch? 
And uh, uh, my uh, co-host at Market Huddle, Kev, uh, Kevin Muir, is uh, just uh, all over this macro trading and rates markets. And he was telling me in the euro uh, uh, dollar uh, futures pits that uh, there are traders being uh, blown up right and left. And there's some really big moves happening uh, in the rates markets and nobody's talking about it. And so I wanted to just highlight what, some really interesting things. Obviously, inflation is the big story. Everyone's talking inflation and how inflation is coming in and uh, is are we going to be in a stagflationary environment but what is really interesting is that typically one would associate um, a secular inflation uh, scenario with the 30-year yields blowing out. If you think of the longest duration asset, uh, one of the biggest components based on the Fisher equation is the uh, idea that, uh, that we're going to have inflation push interest rates higher on the long end of the curve. And we're not seeing that. We're seeing almost all of the movement in shorter to the uh, term rates to, in the middle of the curve. So what we have here in the top left corner is that two-year yield. And it, on the top uh, right is the uh, five-year yield. And uh, it's just showing you how we're seeing the steepening. And many uh, on even the euro dollar curves and other ones, you're seeing you know 50 basis points in a week or two that have, uh, have kicked in. Everyone is pricing in monetary tightening and it's not just the US you're seeing this happen uh, in Canada and Europe and in Asian markets uh, it's almost like there's a a call for global central banks to start a tightening cycle and they're pricing it in the curves right across the board and what's really amazing is that the the fives and 30s are not uh, sorry tens and 30s are not really responsive and uh, what one interesting way to observe that is if we go to the second chart um, the second page on this uh, where we have it here, you can see uh, what I have is the yield curve uh, spread between the 30-year yield and the five-year yield. And uh, what you continue to see is a flattener uh, underway. Uh, the, the yield curve flattener is coming and, uh, and it's not inverted. We don't have any inverted curve, especially since the Fed is still pinned Fed funds right at the front of the curve, right at the bottom of, uh, of that. But we are seeing flattening. And uh, that is not what I expected to see if, uh, if secular inflation and that boogeyman was really here to stay. Uh, and um, and I, I'm trying to kind of make sense of, of what this is. I, I don't know if uh, I'm ready to make a bold prediction, but right now what we do know is no one's paying attention and you're, and you're not really seeing uh, equity markets or any other markets really being responded to this and, or responding to this. And I'm curious as to whether we're observing something that will eventually be the crack in the armor and the, that of, of the market. Uh, yeah, an interesting observation uh, is, is that um, during the last flattening cycle, if you go back to the 2015, 16, 17 years, uh, those years where, where, the, uh, where we saw the yields flattening throughout that cycle uh, was a period where the stock market didn't necessarily crash or anything, but it was a very poor performance period that was a very flat. I mean, if maybe if you pull up an S&P chart going back to those years, you can see that there was generally uh, an, a period where it just wasn't a, a strong performance in there, including that was where the uh, we had a, a couple of sell-offs in, uh, in late 2015 into 16, where we had that Jamie Diamond bottom and all of uh, all of those events occurring. Uh, but you can see the market was really flat. And I, I asked the question: Is that after such a huge run on the upside, if in fact uh, a flattener is uh, a reality of what's going to be happening here. Is this going to mean that the stock market is going to lose some of the wind in its sails and, and start to kind of get sluggish up along these highs? Uh, that's uh, certainly something that's on my mind. Usually everyone gets excited when Fed is pumping liquidity into the market. This kind of tightening, uh, monetary tightening is the opposite. No one wants to admit that that uh, could have the opposite effect in this cycle. Uh, the, the final thing I wanted to touch on, and, you can make, and I'd love to hear your opinion on as well, but uh, just showing that dynamic yield curve back on that chart I was, share, uh, I was uh, showing earlier. Uh, this is one of the, my favorite features uh, that you guys have on your site. 
And what I love about it is you got the trailing length, that little bar at the bottom that allows you to see where the yield curve was even up to 30 days ago. And what's interesting is you can really see how the belly of the curve is turning up and, uh, and uh, really starting to, to uh, flatten there. But you can see that Fed has got it pinned right down in the, at the front of the curve. And it'll be really interesting to see, you know, Canada just announced that they were going to do four rate hikes next year. I think that that was the, uh, the announcement. I certainly have no idea whether Powell would, uh, is, uh, is going to maybe – maybe two rate hikes if, if they're going to ever get to doing them. Uh, but it, it's certainly going to be interesting to see how the market uh, develops here and what the implications would be. It's, uh, it's so many great points that you made in there, uh, Pat. And I think, you know, what I've, what I've reminded people is anyone that if you've not been investing before 1980, you really haven't experienced a rising rate environment with any extended, you know, period. Um, you know, so, so most of us, I would say many people in the markets, they really haven't learned what that means and seen an, seen an environment where something like a bank has, a, has any decent chance of outperforming a, a FANG stock, right? But we may mm -hmm. be in that environment if you, if you do start to see rates certainly go to the upside. We have to wrap up. Pat, listen, it's awesome to have you on the show. Thanks for highlighting some of the really cool features on stock charts and helping us think a little bit about, about the interest rate environment. I, I think you're right. I think people need to pay a little more attention to it. Uh, Pat Serezna, stay safe, be well. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you very much, David. That's Pat Serezna. Pat is the co-host of the Market Huddle and the Macro uh, Voices podcast. That's really, really well done. Him and, uh, him and Kevin do a really good job with the Market Huddle. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, and, uh, and the founder of Big Picture Trading. He mentioned, by the way, the dynamic yield curve. And if you've not used that feature on stock charts before, I will be totally honest. When I was first learning about interest rates and I was taught what interest rates were because I knew nothing about it before I arrived at uh, Bloomberg in the year 2000. And uh, I was shown this uh, tool on stockcharts.com and it helped me so much to make sense of things. If you go to charts and tools at the top, go to the dynamic yield curve, you can actually put the yield curve in motion. You can go back over time. You can start watching how the S&P moves and see what yields were like and look at what happens in different interest rate environments. Great way to understand the relationship between stocks and bonds there. We need to continue on today's show, talk about uh, earnings. Our next segment, the bottom line, is focusing on some of the names that are uh, that are reporting this week. Uh, you know, on a, on a week like this, I, you know, in the meat of earnings season, uh, there are so many charts we could look at. And I wish we could look at all of them. We're going to look at as many as we can. Uh, today on, uh, on Wednesday after the close, we have two sort of big ones uh, to pay attention to, Ford and eBay. You know, when you think about the, uh, the automakers, you know, obviously we start with Tesla, which was earlier this week, uh, you know, going higher. It's the last couple of days. It's, uh, you know, continue to close higher, but Tesla's actually close, close below the open, which is sort of an interesting contrary move, right? A higher close, which means it's making progress, but you're seeing distribution during the trading day, which is not super encouraging uh, in the short term. That tells you there's, you know, selling coming in. People are selling in on the strength of the stock, which is reasonable after the stock has had the run that it has touching uh, 1100 yesterday. But overall, I would still be watching that 950 uh, level and 900 below that. That's the breakout level from January, the, uh, the gap that we just experienced recently. Uh, GM was actually this morning, you can see that GM is down about five 5.4% today. And so again, it had a, a, a jump back above the 200-day uh, moving average, sort of trading around here over the last uh, couple of weeks and now gapping back below the 200-day the, uh, the moving average, which you know overall is not an encouraging uh, follow-through. Ford, by the way, reporting today after the close and, uh, and so far was down 2.7%. We can look and see how things are going after the close. And there's a reminder, if you go to the symbol summary page, you can see uh, you know, after hours trading. So actually, I have not looked at these earnings. We're, we're kind of in mid-show. It's hard for me to track all of the earnings that are coming out. But Ford's actually trading higher, five and uh, five and a quarter percent uh, after the close today. Actually, might be a really interesting chart to look at. Trading up to around sixteen thirty. Uh, now, what's interesting is that that's no guarantee that tomorrow is going to look anything like the after hours session. It's a reminder. I forget what name it was earlier this week. Was you know, uh, traded a lot higher after the close, uh, you know, in the after hour session, but then was right down the next day. Um, I think that was uh, Facebook actually on Facebook's earnings. Had the, you know, traded higher in the after hours and then Tuesday opened and it was right back down below the 200 days. So no guarantees, but that's the uh, short-term segment that you're getting uh, there today. Other charts to look at, you know, PayPal is a really uh, frustrating chart if you're, if you're bullish <laughs> or if you're long. Because overall, this has shown, you know, I think a, a period of accumulation. 
Then this six month period that's sort of a, or eight, eight, nine month period that's sort of a lack of follow through, right? You made a new all time high in February on a relative basis, just, you know, looks like it's going to go to the moon. Uh, and then from there, you came off, went below the 50 day moving average uh, here in March. From there, we retested the all time highs there in July and then failed to get above there. And, you know, I, I will tell you one of the things that I've learned over my career stocks trying to get above their previous uh, all-time highs and failing to do so is not usually an encouraging uh, bullish long-term sign. That's a sign of weakness. So a failure to get above the previous high and then a gap lower trading below the 50-day is uh, is discouraging. So that is one thing, getting below the 50-day, really unable to get back above it, You know, not able to follow through a break back above the 50-day. Making a lower high in early September is discouraging. Once again, failing to get above the 50-day here uh, a couple of weeks ago, breaking new swing lows. So while today's sell-off is sort of a, you know, a significant move, three plus percent, not super surprising, I think, the direction of that momentum because you've seen the signs of deterioration along the way, right? There's a stock that rotated from an accumulation phase to a, to a consolidation phase, really, to now more of a, a tactical distribution phase. I think now you're looking at the previous support. If you look 230 to 240, maybe a little lower, 225, these are the lows from January, from March, uh, from May, we've sort of been in this same sort of level. I'd be looking to see if that level of support can uh, can hold. In that same group, you have Visa and MasterCard. Uh, Visa today uh, down almost 7%, uh, getting below its 200-day moving hours. That's not a great sign. MasterCard as well, down 6%. So these have uh, had a pretty, pretty tough day and both testing key support levels. So overall, seeing quite a bit of distribution in, uh, in some of those. You also have like... Um, Global payments. I'm trying to think of what name that was. GPN. Yeah, down, uh, down as well. So you know, you're seeing a lot of distribution in the payment processors. I think overall, the path of least resistance certainly seems down until proven otherwise. You know, a chart like GPN. It's hard for me to get excited about that chart. I get the ex I get the idea of buying weakness and buying low and selling high. I get that concept. However, I have learned that buying things on the way down can be pretty painful. So, for example, there are a lot of times when you could argue. GPN had gone down a lot, which it had, but never confused the bottom of the page with support is what I was told. And failing at the major low in October and blowing through it again this week is not good. The fact that the relative strength has been consistently down uh, for the course of the year is, uh, is a concern as well. That gets me to Boeing, which is the last one we'll have time for. Chart like BA, I get the idea that you're at support. Overall, I could see the idea of taking a, a, a short-term position and seeing if you can you know, play the short-term weakness. However, I see a chart in distribution mode, making consistent lower highs, failing to get back above moving averages, the RSI failing at 60, the relative strength going down. That's a chart in distribution mode. I'm not struggling to find those, by the way, as I'm looking around. We need to wrap the show though. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is LVS. We didn't talk about this one again. There's so many uh, stocks on the move this week. I feel like we could have an entire show just full of individual names, but this is an interesting one. I was often, I was asked recently about bottom fishing and what that might look like. LVS might be the type of chart that could be compelling, and I'll tell you why. We're near the March 2020 lows, which is actually pretty unusual for stocks. Most stocks are well above those levels, but LVS has retraced most of those gains from 2020 now. Bullish momentum divergence with lower lows August into September, higher lows in momentum with the second low uh, not getting to the oversold region. So overall, that's a sign of potential accumulation. Relative strength has stabilized. We're back above the 50-day moving average. We've made a higher low. Can we make a new swing high? That would be interesting. Can the RSI get above 60? That would be the indication to me that we're starting to rotate more to a period of accumulation. I'd be looking to 46, which is that first Fibonacci resistance level using the March 2020 and March 2021 uh, range. Chart number two is Boeing. I mentioned that. I didn't I'll highlight the Fibonacci support level, but it's worth noting that if you take the March 2020 low, the March 2021 high, you then take 38.2% of the way down. That's where we found support in July. That's also where we found support in September. And that's right where we are today after the stock sold off one and a half percent. So we're right down to the oversold level. We're right to a Fibonacci level. This would be the time for a stock like BA to potentially bounce higher. I'd look to see if that can happen. There are also concerns because if we break there, You'd have a lot of uh, a lot of daylight down to around 160, 165, which would be the next Fibonacci support level. Finally, Ether. And if you look at cryptocurrencies, again, a lot of movement, a lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty. But my conversation with Roman Bogomazov yesterday made me think a lot more about the long-term trends. Ether is at its previous all-time highs from May and September. Can it get above there? That would be my main question as it's pulling back from all-time highs. That's our show for today. Special thank you to Pat Stresna joining us. 
from Big Picture Trading. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.